Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Tiko, and I help run events here at The Strand. Before we launch into a discussion of John Darnell's new book, Devil House, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Searching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 94 years, The Strand is the sole survivor, now run by third generation owner, Nancy Bass Whiten. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers and authors, such as John, we wouldn't be here today. We are thrilled to have John Darnell with us for a discussion of his new book, Devil House. John Darnell's first novel, Wolf and White Band, was a New York Times bestseller, National Book Award nominee, and a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for First Fiction. His second, his second Universal Harvester, was also a New York Times bestseller and was a finalist for the Locus Award. He is the writer, composer, guitarist, and vocalist for the band the Mountain Goats. He lives in Durham, North Carolina with his wife and sons. Joining John is one of our Strand booksellers, Boyce Terrell Allen. Boyce Terrell Allen is the host of Talk Music Talk, a music podcast featuring long form conversations with people connected to music. He was also the host and producer of the Strandcast, Strand's official podcast. Strand is, a uh, Boyce, I'm sorry, is also an author and musician. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming John and Boyce to the stage. Hello, hello. Hi, John. How's it going? I'm pretty good. You remember I was going to try and make some coffee while the, the coffee yes, doesn't yes. agree with me, so I'm having all kinds of things. Okay. <laughs> no problem, John. Uh, hi, again. I'm Boyce from The Strand. Thank you, everyone, Pleasure. for joining in tonight for the release of John's book, Devil House. We are going to have a reading from John, and then after that, I will talk to him. John, are you all set? I'm, I'm born ready, my friends. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, here is here's the book. It's always very exciting to hold up the hardback. I only first saw it uh, about a week ago. Um, the um, a thing it, you always got to sort of frame a reading. So, um, the book has a mirror structure. The first part is in the first person. The second part is in the second person, and the third part is in the third person. And then that goes the other way at the second half of the book. Um, and so this is from the second part, which is uh, the book that the narrator, uh, Gage Chandler, made his bones on. Um, oh, somebody's asking if they have audio issues. I'm hoping that, uh, that people can hear me. Um, if you can't hear me, obviously, then you can't respond to, to the question. I hear you on my mind. OK, good. Um, so uh, but that's the paradox of asking people what <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, so this is uh, the narrator, Gage Chandler, speaking to uh, uh, speaking to the white witch of Morro Bay, um, uh, whose crimes we learn of later. Uh, you are sound asleep. It's one in the morning in the parking lot. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say about this, uh, this is a, there's a Taco Bell that figures prominently in this, presuming that everybody uh, listening is on their computers <laughs> or phones. If you Google, uh, Credence Clearwater Revival Taco Bell. You will see a picture of the outside of this Taco Bell, which was the only Taco Bell I knew of when I was a child because I grew up in San Luis Obispo when I was very young. So, um, so yeah, but and there's a particular legendary photo of Credence when they were playing at Cal Poly down the road uh, at this Taco Bell when Taco Bells used to have outside fire pits and stuff. So that could situate this for you. All right, you are sound asleep. It's one in the morning. In the parking lot of the Taco Bell over in San Luis Obispo, Jean and Jesse are sitting side by side in the front seat of Jean's blue Ford Torino. Jean is too high to drive, but nobody can tell Jean anything when he's high. Jesse hopes that the bag of tacos they're working through will help him drive less erratically. And then maybe Jesse will mention <laughs> that Miss Crane said he should come back to class that it's no big deal. Taco Bell is closed now. Gene is a cook there, and he worked closing shift tonight. About an hour ago, he turned the open sign around at the window and scraped down the grill, washing the spatulas and serving spoons afterward in the tiny sink in the back. Then he went back to the line and gloveless assembled 12 tacos. Why it muted me? Um, heavy on the ground beef and light on everything else. 
any leftover beef he has to throw away, but the lettuce and the olives and the tomatoes and the sour cream will go back into cold storage for the night. If he hits the reserves too hard, he's supposed to charge himself for an extra meal on his time card, so Gene's after work tacos consist of hours old seasoned ground beef ladled into a hard shell and given a cursory dressing of two other things apiece, varying it from taco to taco to minimize the amount taken of each ingredient. Sour cream and olives, tomato and lettuce, lettuce and olives, olives and cheese. Some of the combinations don't taste really any good at all without the other stuff that would usually be on there, but Gene doesn't seem to notice. In the front seat, later, a joint in one hand and a Marlboro Red in the other, he identifies each taco by whatever two topping combination it happened to catch. You like tomato and cheese? I got tomato and cheese. Jesse is scared of Gene these days, who seems to be getting worse. He smokes so many cigarettes. It makes him look like one of those people who hang around outside the public library, but never check out any books. He's smoking right now, a sour cream and olive taco in his free hand. He's talking about moving to Oregon. He does this a lot. Gene's never been there, but one of his dad's biker friends moved to Bend last year. Every time he's back in town, he gets drunk with Gene's dad at their kitchen table and talks about how nobody gives a shit what people do up in Oregon. Then, for the next week without fail, these are the stories Gene relays to Jesse. Can eat up in, he says. Even the Oregon cops smoke pot, he says. Super clean microdot coming out of a lab in Eugene. They sell it to you in little vials. You just drop it on your tongue and you're flying, he says. He sticks his tongue out when he says this, pointing at the tip. He's like this all the time now. It's weird and uncomfortable to be around. Jesse doesn't really have any other friends, so he hopes he can be a positive influence on Gene. But at the same time, his own natural stance is a sort of half-paralyzed neutrality. His positive charge is weak. He likes how hanging out with Gene seems to make him care less about stuff that usually bothers him. Moving out, for example, Jesse really wants to get out of his house and live somewhere else by himself. And he knows he's gonna need money to do that first and last and deposit. That's what everybody says. But hear Gene tell it, there's a million ways to get first and last and deposit together. You just say the word, little brother, he says now, drawing on his cigarette, still chewing. People act like money is a big deal. There's a million ways to get money. Nikki comes down here with everything he needs in a brown bag, leaves town with thousands of dollars, thousands, sits in the kitchen, talking on the phone for maybe 10 minutes. Some other people come by a little later and he's good for two months, three, barely has to lift a finger. Nikki is Gene's dad's biker friend because Gene's dad's apartment is such a shithole. Jesse wonders if Nikki, the biker who lives in Oregon now, is exaggerating a little to impress his friend, or if maybe Gene's just making stuff up. It could be either, but there's no point trying to find out when Gene's like this. There's some new apartments over in Los Osos, he continues, Gene, or Jesse, still waiting up the storm. Not even expensive. We could talk to Nikki, get the work done, pay all the upfront on one of those, and shit. Can you even imagine? Right out there on the fucking bay. We can totally put this together. Nikki can probably get us a stereo too. He hooked my dad up with one. Big loud speakers. The way Gene talks about his dad paints a picture of a household in which father and son get along famously. But Jesse knows this is not the case. He doesn't understand why Gene puts so much effort into keeping up this fiction. Gene's father is worse than Jesse's ever was. The magnitude of his presence in Gene's life can hardly be measured. Once, when Jesse was over at Gene's watching television, Gene's dad came into the room, looked at the two teenagers sitting on the floor, and then to his son said, you always going to be a piece of shit? When Gene didn't answer, his father laughed and went back down the hall to the bedroom where a radio was turned up too loud. The living room with the television is also Gene's bedroom. He sleeps on the couch. We should just tell my dad to tell Nikki to find us the biggest speakers he can get, he says now in the car, wiping his mouth with a handful of napkins. 
The tacos are gone. He's slowing down a little. Big honking cherry wood housing, like in that one magazine, remember? I can get money. Jesse does not remember that one magazine. There's a part of him that thinks he should try to steer the conversation someplace else, just in case Gene's serious one of these days. There was the time he shot at the windows of cork and bottle liquors with his BB gun. Nothing ever came of it, but it had been frightening sitting in the passenger seat, watching his friend pull the trigger in the dark, the BBs bouncing impotently off the glass, leaving a bunch of little marks. But the greater part of Jesse is too numb to act. It's just how he is. I know exactly where I could get money, Gene says, his gaze out in the oleander that edges the parking lot. Thank you, John, for the reading. But yeah, this is less festive than what you're holding. But well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a hotel. Yeah, so you have to when you're old. So you know, just to get started for uh, people that have not read the book, what is the plot of the book? What is the book about? And what was the genesis of you writing this book? So uh, the genesis is super complicated, but the uh, but the essential plot. It, it's got four nested stories, and the, the, the framing story is about a true crime writer who, uh, who has a method where he sort of inhabits the property that he writes about and tries to get a feel for what it's like there and what it was like when the crimes in question took place. And that's sort of the method he has made his bones on, right? Um, but then the second part of the book and the sixth part have to do with the first book he wrote, the one that, that sort of made being a writer a viable position for him. And then the third and fifth part are concerned with the book he's working on, the, mm. the place he just moved into. And the middle part is something separate. The inspiration was actually here in Durham in North Carolina uh, because so many things keep going away, right? Uh, these buildings, uh, an office that I finished writing the last book in, there's a strip of land over there that once had a bunch of buildings on it and now there's nothing on it, right? But at one point, uh, there was a building that for about a week was an ad hoc porn store, right? Somebody put up a hand-painted sign. And I live in the South, mm -hmm. right? A business with a hand-painted sign out front sort yeah. of satisfies a number of necessary tropes about the American South. You know? mm -hmm. So, uh, and it said Monster Triple X. And I, my theory is that somebody's uncle, like, got a deal on a thousand porn DVDs and said, we'll rent this storefront for a month. Okay. <laughs> and, and so, so I drove past it once, and and I mentioned it to a friend. I was like, did you see the new the the weird porn store in West Durham? And said, oh yeah, no, I saw Monster Triple X that time. And then the next week it was gone. And then a year later, later all those buildings were raised to the ground. Right? There was no mm -hmm. sign left of it. And I was pretty interested by the idea of a business of which no human trace remained. You know, because yeah, because yeah. somebody at some point, whether they were serious or not, meant to make some go of that. You know, and I thought about that a little bit. Um, and, and the stuff you and I were talking about, uh, before we went live here, uh, Durham is getting gentrified very rapidly. Uh, and, uh, and I thought about how, when, when buildings change hands, that there are human stories behind that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if, if somebody buys the place you're renting and you have to leave, uh, it affects your life in a profound way. And so, so that, that's involved in there. Uh, it, it's, it, it's a big book, so it's got a bunch of other stories yeah. in there, but that was the initial kickoff. Mm -hmm. How did you decide your uh, protagonist would be a true crime writer? Were you a fan of true crime, critic of true crime? Like, how did um, that come about? And his name is Gage uh, Chandler. Well, so I knew, I knew I wanted some bad stuff to go down in the building. <laughs> so I needed yeah. an excuse to have my narrator writing about that. But the other thing is the way I write is I just start writing and figure out what's going on. And then I ask myself some basic essential questions. And the first one I usually ask is, how does this guy pay his rent? You know, and people have actually noticed this. And it, for me, it's something that's pretty obvious. But I mean, I think this one thing that sets me apart is that like, if you read a lot of, you know, not to disrespect anybody, but like, you know, what I think of MFA fiction, yeah. these people don't have jobs, right? Mm -hmm. I cannot relate to a book in which the people don't have to think for eight hours a day. How <laughs> they have to like, like, I struggle with 19th century yeah. fiction this way, in a way that's not true of 18th century. In the 18th century fiction, everybody's mm -hmm. always thinking about how they're gonna get their hands out, you know? Yeah. And, but, uh, but in the 19th century, most of your protagonists are like, oh, we're taken care of. We have a house and servants. 
Mm-hmm. And I don't relate to that. It's like when I'm reading a book, I'm, the first question I have is like, where do you live and how do you afford to live there? Yeah. This tells you a little something about how I grew up. You know? and so, yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's the first thing I do when I have a character, I'll write a paragraph or two of the guys, oh, well, I'm writing a book, you know, and then I think, okay, well, is your book successful? You know, uh, mm-hmm. if not, you know, then how else do you make rent? How long have you been making rent off writing books? I ask all these questions. And with this guy, I was like, okay, well, he's written a book. They must have made a movie out of it if, if it's got to be his only job. You know, they, they must mm-hmm. have, so okay, made a movie. So how how is he special then that they wanted to make a movie because there's a lot of true crime books, you know? So I did all those things. As to true crime itself, I'm an ex-goth, right? I was, so all goths are necessarily kind of enamored of true crime, but a thing happens to you as you grow, especially, I mean, two things. One, historically, I think we're in a moment where we really interrogate the nature of the nonfiction we read, where it's coming from, what good it does or doesn't do mm-hmm. in the world, you know. But beyond that, I'm a parent now, right? And this is really obvious and cheesy stuff, but like yeah. when you become a parent, like I was playing, when my first son was born, I was playing Rainbow Six Vegas, which is a, mm-hmm. a video game, but this is a shooter, right? It's okay. a game which you're, you know, you are an elite team of uh, Navy SEALs or whatever, uh, I can't remember, but you know, you're, you're shooting terrorists. But one thing you're doing is like, you're trying to catch them unawares. You're trying to like yeah. find, come up behind them and put a bullet in their head. And when you have an innocent infant in the house, doing things like that hit differently. Like they're yeah, yeah. Then you go, wow, what a messed up world we've made. We're like, I'm just to shoot people in the head you know? like, mm-hmm. and things like that inform your opinion of true crime also you know it's mm-hmm. like they, they think what what you, you question what's it mean to to immerse yourself in the in the physical details of how people died or how some messed up person mm-hmm. who never had a chance because they were okay. messed up from childhood you know became this messed up you, you start to wonder what's it do to you you know and that, mm-hmm. or, or i do anyway i mean some of that I was like that before I became a parent too. I, I, I always been kind of a, you know, a person asking what are the costs of what you read and okay. the age, you know, that's part of me. So, so some of that, I, okay. I, my, and, my answers never conclude. They just sort of spin out. Okay. So, uh, so had you read plenty of true crime? Were you a fan of it? Uh, I mean, most of the true crime I've read is in the past. Okay. Um, and some of that has to do with the fact that like right now, when you get into something, the internet means you can totally just immerse yourself in the totality of it. Mm-hmm. Whereas when I was in this stuff, you had to really dig, right? You'd find the key texts like Robert Graysmith's Zodiac book or the Helter Skelter book mm-hmm. or, um, you know, Nancy Sponge and that book, and I don't want to live this life. They were pretty obscure. You had to go to the library. You, you couldn't just go to Wikipedia and learn all the stuff about all the criminals. You had to really yeah. dig. Whereas now I think you can go overnight. I mean, I think it's true with all fandoms, right? Like yeah. you can go from knowing nothing about something to being relatively well informed about something in the space of a few hours. Day. <laughs> and I mean, I think it's I, I, you know, I mean, this is obviously a very 54-year-old man take, but I think you should actually have to put some skin in the game yeah, <laughs> yeah, to get yeah. into something, you know, uh, just for the experience of it. But uh, but yeah, so I was kind of interested, but I was always a little skeeved out by the dudes who were too into it, and they've often they'd be like splatter movie dudes who like thought it was all very funny. And I always like, you know, these are stories of human suffering and I am a soft hearted guy at heart, you know, mm-hmm. and I always think, you know, I remembered a friend of mine, a guy I spent a summer with who was a singer of a band called Christian death. And he was really into, into serial killers, especially ones from the 19th century, like Peter Curtin, the vampire of Dusseldorf. And we were hanging out in the summer of 85, like getting drunk every night. Yeah. when when Richard Ramirez started murdering people in Southern California yeah. and he became terrified like because yeah. we were in Pomona and and then Ramirez struck like one town over right and we were both like a oh, serial killer is amazing hilarious yeah, you know, yeah. very into John. and suddenly my dude was closing his windows at night he always slept with his windows wide open mm-hmm. to California houses and it was a moment for me it was like oh yeah no this stuff is really funny until it touches you yeah because yeah. there's this distance is, otherwise yeah yeah. I mean, that speaks to a lot of things. A lot of things were were in sociopolitically at the moment, you know, that like for a lot of, you know, a lot of progressive people who hold a position about the liberation of this or that community until until they're confronted with the reality of that. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly they become more conservative and you think, well, your politics were nothing until they involved real people, you know. Yeah. And I mean, the same is true with, with engagement of, of stuff like that. It's like, you know, 
crime is crime is something you think about until somebody takes your stuff and then you mm -hmm. have a different opinion yeah. about it. <laughs> so, uh, you know and uh and so and that stuff figures into it for me with with, with this you know uh I mean, at the same time, one of the central crimes in this is like, you know, I'm on the side of whoever's holding the sword, kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, your character, uh, Gage, is sort of wrestling, even though he's a true crime writer, he wrestles with, you know, do you are these characters or are these real people? Like, what yeah. do you say in a book to heighten, you know, the, the dramatics of it? Like, he struggles with that. Yeah, well, he gets, he get, in part six, he gets a letter from somebody who was closely engaged from Janet Perez, who's who was the mother of one of the people that he wrote of of, uh, of Jesse, uh, who we just mm -hmm. heard about. And Jesse dies, and uh, and he's murdered. And uh, and Jean writes the story of his murder. And and Jesse's mother writes to him twenty years later to say, you know, for you, Jesse was like a blocking figure. He's only there mm -hmm. to make your story happen. You know, but but this was my son. You know, mm -hmm. and that's and that. That's the stuff I'm near to is is the human the human element in stuff, you know, and it's like yeah. sort of what it was one of my strengths as a songwriter is like there are no minor characters because in your own life, you are not a minor character. No, yeah. there are none. Right. There's no such thing as a minor character. There's no, you know, like um, there's this word player that we play with. Well, everyone's a player in their own life mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and to suggest that or, or, or like, you know, Really terrible people. I talk about NPCs right now, non-player characters. Yeah, but we're all player characters. Everybody is. And this is an essentially, at the end of the day, a Christian notion that, like you know, in the eyes of the Creator, we mm -hmm. are all. No one is more valuable than anybody else. Yeah. We're all absolutely infinitely precious, right? And and I, I mean, this is like when I go to write books, I think about this. Like the most minor person working the most terrible job, you know, mm -hmm. flipping burgers wherever, is of as much value to God as you know as the person who runs the world and the thing is in early 20th century american fiction the opposite is true like the only people who are important yeah. ones who make a lot of money right uh, <laughs> and i've always been very intrigued by this i think dreiser starts to mess with this a little bit but uh but yeah so so this is stuff i think about okay so does that play into why like the cast of characters are people that may be seen to a lot of people is not that important and yeah. that they their choices are limited in their lives yeah, I mean, I, I, as a person, I am not interested in so-called important people. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't care about people who haven't washed a dish for a living. I just don't care yeah. about people at all. I mean, I, I wish them well, and I hope they have good and reward. Yeah, yeah. You know, but I don't want to write about them because uh, I don't know what their lives are like. And uh, uh, you know, even though like I'm a writer and a musician, I'm doing fine. I'm, I'm having yeah. a good time. You know, but my first job was washing dishes at Lord Charlie's, and uh, you know, and. You know, you never really forget spraying down when you wash dishes. I don't know if you've ever done it, but like yeah, you, yeah. Stand, you stand on a rubber thing with holes in it. Yeah. Or food is going to fall down. Right. And at the end of the night, you have to take those out to the loading dock and spray all the nasty <laughs> bread and broccoli out of those. And it stinks real bad. And you never forget, you know, uh, doing that. And I, 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 you know, I always want the people in my in my books to be people who can smell. What the what the rubber thing that you spray mm -hmm. down is like i i can't stand to write any characters who don't know that yeah. gage is a little weird in that way because gage goes straight to school to college from high school which i didn't do i had several years off um and uh and i got in on a weird program that allowed you to go in without having had good grades um but uh but gage is a guy who has not had to wash any dishes right yeah but he his work puts him in touch with the people who have you know, and he eventually mm -hmm. is made to feel their impact. Okay. What uh, perspective do you think that gives him that he's sort of hovering, or maybe hover is not the word, but he's not of them, but he deals with them? So, I mean, I think he is an empathetic enough person. I mean, it takes him a few books to get here, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he's got a gig, is the thing. Is like, I'm not... Uh, I don't want to frame this as an indictment of true crime because I don't yeah. believe in indicting anybody's hustle. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. anybody, anything somebody's doing to get over, we're all trying to do stuff. And it's like, I'm not going to, you know, but, but, but he, he is becoming aware. He starts working in this field as a young man and he's made aware by people responding to him that like, you're writing about real people. You're, you're telling true stories about people's mm -hmm. lives and their lives go on after, after your interest wanes, yeah. you know? Um, this relates in, in some sense to a thing that my poetry professor, Robert Mezzi, said to me once when, uh, when 
he was talking about some poet who had been just beastly to his wife or something. And I was like, how could he? This is one of the most sensitive poets in the history. Yeah. And he said, oh, artists are monsters. They really are. <laughs> it's, like, it's kind of true. It's like an artist will sell. It's a Joan Didion line who she got from also that artists are always selling somebody out. And mm -hmm. it's true. If you're an artist, you will eventually go, well, look, you told me that in private, but it's too good a line. So I'm not going to say who you are, but I'm certainly using the yeah. line. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> There's a whole song there. Right? Yeah, no, totally. Uh, but uh, but yeah, but, but Gage, um, I, I think he grows up a lot in this book, which is mm -hmm. a thing that like I'm sort of resistive to because I think that's sort of a natural arc of books and I sort of resist most natural narrative arcs. But I think Gage learns something about who he is and mm -hmm. what you know, and what has managed to uh, to pay his rent and put food on his on his yeah. table for several years over the course of the book, right? And that to mm -hmm. me is like, and that to me that's interesting. Yeah. Did you have to uh, like what was your research? Did you have to read true crime novels to see what works? Because you sort of get the perspective where it's uh, Gage is talking about his own life and how he's approaching this, but then also it's as, as you're reading the book itself. So I bought a bunch of them, but I didn't finish most of them. I would like skim mm -hmm. them and look through them. Um, a fair bit of just regular crime fiction, because I think, okay. it's, I mean, crime fiction, I think, uh, I, I'm going to feel bad about using this, but I'm going to say that it's yeah. a little more sophisticated than true crime, which is like sort of like, it tends to be less, uh, less, although I did read, what was that book? Oh, man, I can't quite place the name of it. Robert, the guy wrote a book about Indonesia, and he wrote a book about a Japanese serial killer. Uh, publisher, and I can't think of uh, what his name is. Um, but uh, but I did read. He's really good, and so it was, mm -hmm. it was a complicated book. Um, but I looked into it. I bought a bunch of them, skimmed them. But I mainly thought because I'm a writer, is like, well, if I wanted to write one of these books, what would I pitch my editor? What would I? Okay. What would I, yeah. I wanted to write because I bet Sean would go go for it, right? Mm -hmm. And would deal with any complications down the line. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so that's what I did. I was like, because I think there's a sense in which true crime is fiction. You know, it's like it's telling yeah. true stories, but we all know from our own lives that the true story has no narrative arc, right? Mm -hmm. Your life is too complex to say that, well, here this happened and then this happened. This is why that happened. Our lives are full of contradictions yeah. and 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 unresolvable things, and we are equally hero and villain multiple times every day. Mm -hmm. Like anybody who can say that, oh, my life is a story of growth toward being a good person. Well, God bless you. <laughs> it's like me, <laughs> you know, there's versions of myself on any given day that I wouldn't pay $5 for, you know, mm -hmm. there's versions of myself that I feel are noble and good, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and so, so I thought about that and I thought, well, that's probably true of, of anybody, right? True crime, except that they also, the other thing I thought about when you look at stories of crime, you're immersing yourself in some stuff that leaves a mark on you. You know, and like, and that I, I believe that, that like, you know, that you should be careful about what you choose to hear about or watch. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think this is something we learned with the internet 15 years ago or so, where like, you know, suddenly there were uh, people making JPEGs out of decapitations and stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You should avoid a place that's going to show you something like that mm -hmm. without your consent, you know, because yeah. that will leave a mark on you. That stuff, you can't just passively take that in without yeah. becoming a certain kind of person. And I believe that not everybody does, but that's my position. Yeah. So what is it we're supposed to learn from true crime? Like, is it wrong just to see it as entertainment? Do you think? No, I don't think it's wrong. I mean, this thing is like, and this is what's funny is like, I mean, I think we're all agreed on, on the left side of the spectrum, like that dudes, especially white dudes, who mm -hmm. shake their fists too much about free speech are terrible, you know? <laughs> but, <laughs> but at the same time, I don't think it's wrong to read anything. Yeah, you should read and take in whatever entertains you and gives you pleasure in this life because pleasure is a precious commodity in this life. Mm -hmm. But I do think that uh, that you sort of have a human responsibility to be critical about what you read and take mm -hmm. in, right? And to be honest about what you're getting out of it, you know, and to do that work, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, to 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 sort of you know, and and the thing is, like, if you're reading true crime and and in point of fact, what you get off in, on is the details. Yeah, you should probably just work on yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, is that really who you want to be? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and uh, but on the other hand, I do think a lot of people read it uh, for for exactly this reason, which is good and noble, to affirm that they're not that, right? I mean, yeah, you know, slasher movies and Grand Guignol and stuff. You read it and engage it to go, 
here's what I'm not. Here's who I will never be. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we do this a little, with a lot of hate reading on the internet that you read. Um, you know, we watch these videos of like anti-masker guys showing yeah. up. You watch like 10 of these. We don't need to see them. Those guys yeah, are not yeah. going to give you any variation. They're all the same. Uh -huh. <laughs> but you watch them to go, man, I may have been not cool to some people in my life today. <laughs> But I'm, I'm not, not uh, that. That's <laughs> <laughs> very affirming. And that is healthy. I mean, that's like, it's very primitive. I think it's mm -hmm. very, very, you know, it's very, you know, early society human thing to do to look at somebody who sucks and go, I'm not you. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but I think, I think that's part of it too. You know, it's yeah. like you, you read this to remind yourself that whatever your flaws are, you didn't kill anybody today. Mm -hmm. And if, if you'd been tempted, you still wouldn't have done it. And if you, it, and if you did do it, you'd, you'd write yourself out. You wouldn't yeah, really yeah. get away with it. And like, I mean, that stuff is like, like that's so primitive, so basic, you know, mm -hmm. but it's good to affirm. Like, you know, we, when we talk casually all the time, like, ah, I wish I could fucking kill that guy, you know, yeah. but you know, you know, actually the human being, if it came down to it, you would only murder somebody to save somebody else's life. You would not actually kill somebody because mm -hmm. you want to be that guy. And that stuff is important, um, you know, so I think that's part of what goes into true crime, but there's so much of it, right? And you can, what we were talking about earlier, it's like you can, you can immerse yourself so deeply in it that I think that's what becomes unhealthy is to like glut yourself on stuff that actually you should mm -hmm. be enjoying a little taste of reminding yourself of your better self instead of just going, oh, and it, now I know all the details about all, every victim of the BTK killer or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And what is the benefit of that? Yeah, I don't think it's good. I, I think yeah, yeah. Good. You uh, mentioned before you start reading about the structure of the book. If you could go into detail about how you came up with the structure and the different point of views for each section, the sections. So, um, I knew I wanted to write a big book, right? And it's like not. I, I knew I wanted it to be long because I because I had a feeling that writing a long book would take me someplace that I hadn't been before. I'd mm -hmm. done two regular sized novels and then a novella before. And so I wanted to see what, you know, what it's like to, to, to explore further realms. Yeah. As a challenge to yourself? Say again? Was this as a challenge to yeah, yourself? Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. And, uh, and so I asked myself, how would you do that? I said, well, I mean, we have, want to be in multiple parts. And, and, and I got this idea about doing stuff with person. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. A part of that was because there's a person slippage in my previous book, Universal Harvester. There's mm -hmm. a moment where it slips from the first person to the to the um, uh, no, it slips from the third person to the first person. Right. Okay. And it's just in the space of one line, right, mm -hmm. where somebody says we instead of instead of they. Right. Yeah. And it's 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 quite a moment. A lot of people noticed it. And when I wrote it, it was electrifying. Uh, and I went, oh, person is interesting. You know, it's like if you choose to write the first person, that's very different from writing the second or the mm -hmm. well, first half of the third. The second person is pretty uncommon as a as a fictive thing. So so I got this. I started thinking about book structures. I was just scratching my head, intellectual style, and I thought, well, what if it was like? And I like to. I'm not into actual numerology, but mm -hmm. I like people who are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, like a lot of. Um, there's just a lot of stuff I've engaged where people really engage numerology in earnest, mm -hmm. right? I'm not that, yeah. but I'm fascinated by it, you know? Um, and uh, uh, and so so I got this idea of like, well, okay, well, if you were playing with persons, what you want first, second, third person, and then I got the idea of a mirror structure. It would go one, two, three, three, mm -hmm. two, one. But I'm, I was unsatisfied by a perfect symmetry and so I thought of what would I do in the middle section? And, mm -hmm. and, and it was very, it was really like, it's very abstract thinking. But what was yeah. satisfying about it is like, this is an abstract concept. And then when you start writing it, it becomes very visceral, but especially in the second person sections. I think those are the best ones in the book. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that where it's real, when you're writing the second person, something different happens. You're addressing a you. But mm -hmm. if I'm saying alone in a room out loud, you, 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 who am I talking to? The mirror, you know? Yeah. It's pretty interesting for me. Okay. Do you, uh, are there challenges for you in writing the different point of views? Like one you favor over the other? Um, I mean, the third person is the one that comes the least naturally to me. And uh, in part five, I, I landed on a solution for that where I wrote these things as, as, as sort of magazine pieces, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, because I struggle with, with the omniscient narrator, you know, and third person is that. Right? The third person is the one where you make these sweeping statements about, stuff and i'm kind mm -hmm. of you know 
very a post 80s kid where I don't feel like I have the standing to comment generally on stuff. You know? yeah. <laughs> so yeah. whereas if I'm speaking subjectively or if I'm speaking to you subjectively, then I can say things that 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 land. But for the third person, it was super interesting. Um, but then, I mean, the thing is, with all the groundwork laid by the first couple parts, then I sort of, you, you, you settle into that authorial ambition. It's like, well, only one person knows anything about these characters, and that person yeah. is me. You know? Okay. So, <laughs> so you, do, you do sort of warm up to it. But I, because I think about the moral and ethical quantities of writing, like, then I question how healthy that is. You know? mm -hmm. I feel like you're the omniscient person, because none of us, yeah. you know, I mean, this is again corny, but like until you can walk on water, you don't have any omniscience at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're yeah. actually kind of ignorant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, so yeah, I was like, I always try to be writing from a position of ignorance, and third person doesn't. Third person is all about writing from omniscience. Okay. So that was interesting so, to, to adopt that. Yeah. So how did that connect with you have Gage, true crime writer, who's talking about what people are doing in a room and both characters are dead, both people are dead. It's, as a true crime writer, that you have to be, I guess, sometimes yeah. omniscient. Yeah. So I, so it's method acting, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm used to this as a songwriter. You know that, like, when you start writing songs, you, any given song, right? Mm -hmm. You sort of, you're, in, you're doing improv, right? And uh, do you have any experience in improv comedy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I go, okay, you are working at a restaurant and it's really busy and it's mm -hmm. your first night on the job and they've told you that you're in orientation and you don't get paid unless uh unless everybody's table is clear by 10. yeah go right <laughs> and then if you're doing improv i used to speak this reality right and you go um, okay, Lisa, could you please uh, deal with table five over there? Because they need to go. They're done eating, right? And you start doing all this stuff automatically. Yeah. I do this as a writer where I'm just like, I immediately put myself in the situation. I'm used to doing mm -hmm. this as a songwriter where you write the first line, um, a song last year, two years ago from Get Famous. The first line was, you were born for these flashing lights, right? And uh, so then you, in songs, you have the advantage of like, well, I need to rhyme that, right? Yeah. So that helps you along to the next line. But you get really used to this over the course of time. Of, of just sort of improving your way into a character, right? Instead of saying, mm -hmm. mapping the character, you just write. And the first draft is usually not good. You mm -hmm. get enough raw stuff that you go, okay, well, here's cool. He says he's descended from royalty. Well, what's, how is that even possible? You know, is he yeah. one of those? And like, so then you're faced with a, a sort of a decision tree. Mm -hmm. Is he a genealogy guy? Like, has he got some paper map? No, uh -huh. I can't relate to that at all. <laughs> so, it's like, so it must be a myth in his family. That I can relate to a little better. And, uh, and you do all these things that sort of like, you know, you ask yourself, there's a lot of question asking where you go, okay. how is this true? And sometimes it's based on simplicity. It's like, if it's true this way, then mm -hmm. I have to go find out a bunch of stuff that I don't even know about at all. If it's in this way, I can relate it to my own experience and it's a little easier, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and but it's never your exact experience. And, uh, and so that's how. Oh, okay. And for, do you see like the way you work for songwriting and writing novels, the similarities, you know, outside? Well, they're very of... different because like I said, there's a jumping off point, but with a song, songs are, are, are sketches and people who are hearing them tend to bring themselves to it a lot easier because there's the visceral mm -hmm. experience of music, you know, and a verbal communication. Whereas with a book, you absolutely have to, uh, uh, fill in so much detail, right? Um, and I, I mean, the way I write is still, I, I try to leave enough space for people to enter and explore. That's why I like, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, uh, and a lot of French writers in the 50s and 60s were interested in this, of like leaving enough space so that you're not dictating the experience of the read, you know. But with a song, you really, uh, you, you strike this cool balance of like, hitting a bunch of specific details, but leaving it open enough that anybody can relate to it at any angle. And that's really an important thing in, in music is like not trying not to seal it off, trying to leave it open because music yeah. is considerably more universal language than, than, than written literature. Music is for everybody. You know? mm -hmm. So is literature in the final analysis, but music is so primal and basic that you want to be writing in a way that like nobody's going to feel left out. Yeah. And that's sort of the, you don't have to think about when you're doing it, but that's what that's what your practice pursues, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas when you're writing, 
you feel like you are really trying to to get into specifics, trying to 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 seal off a lot of possibilities and just leaving open the one. In a sense, it's kind of Svengali, like you're leading people through a door, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how long did you uh, work on this book? Uh, five or six years, I think. It was a long. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Although my first book took a long time, insofar as like I wasn't really writing a book, I was just doing a thing. And mm -hmm. then my the guy who became my agent said, "Oh, I heard you were writing stuff. Do you want me to show it to somebody?" And I was like, oh, "Yeah, why not? Here's some stuff." And then it became focused. But before that, it was just like stuff I was doing in my spare time. But this one, I whenever Universal Harvester came out about a year before that, I was already starting on this. So I think that was 2014. I think I'm okay. not sure. Um, uh so yeah i think it took five or six years it went through a lot of changes there was a lot mm -hmm. of giant changes in the process uh which was very rewarding in a long book because with a shorter book you don't usually go back and change massive stuff whereas with this there were huge just there's most of part parts three and five got completely traded out for something different uh and that was like and that's really like in terms of process is something mm -hmm. you can't really share but it's so much a part of the book, you know, that like, oh yeah, the day I decided, here's 50,000 words that were just study that aren't yeah. actually gonna happen. They're all just, like, that, that is pretty, you know, it's not traumatic, it's the opposite. It's like a mm -hmm. growth moment. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. Great, John. So I think we're gonna open it up to uh, Q and A. We also you froze. Oh no. Hold on. <laughs> oh, you see that now. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we are from Henry. Do you give particular weight to first and last lines of the entire book or chapters or anything else you write? So yes, it's a great question. Um, the first line of the book, the first last line of the book, I I give some weight to, but I don't sweat it too hard. I'm not trying mm -hmm. to have mother died today or was it yesterday? I'm not trying yeah. to do that, you know, but the one thing I give a lot of weight to, and this has to do with uh, the fact that I'm a musician first, when any given section, like most of my books, all of them uh, have, like here's uh, in part three, there's all these subsection titles, mm -hmm. right? The last line of any given subsection, I want yeah. to land in a rhythmic way. I want, okay. I want you to feel like you've come to a natural rest that resolves the same way as the last cymbal crash of a song, mm -hmm. whether it's a soft crash or a hard one, I want it to have that feeling, or the or the or the last string fading out of a of the movement of a concerto or whatever. Okay. Um, so I think hard about that stuff, and that's the the stuff that I do out loud, where I everything I write gets mm -hmm. read out loud multiple times, so that specifically that it will resolve in that sort of not necessarily crescendoing, but 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 essentially musical way. Um, okay. First and last line of the book, less so, but you do think about it. I mean, like the last line of the book, you sort of feel like it ought to be good. At the same time, it's like there is no ideal last line of the book. Yeah, yeah. The whole nature of books is uh, there's always more to say. You know? Okay. Did you come up with that structure before you saw the new heading of how to have it? I don't remember it land? how that was such a wild time when I came up with the subheaders. Like it was really super wild that like I, I had to, because I knew I wanted each chapter of that section to have seven subheaders. So I had to do math and go, okay, so there's 49 subheaders, there's gonna be 49 subtitles. Where mm -hmm. are they coming from? Where are they gonna be? And, and, and each one had to tether to a specific plot line. So I wrote them all out on little physical, I cut up these note cards and wrote them all, all the subheaders out. And then mm -hmm. I had to set them out on a desk and it was very intense. It was really cool. <laughs> uh, uh, so I don't, I mean, the thing I mainly remember is like wanting to sort of satisfy each storyline so you didn't wind up too separated from any given mm -hmm. thing. But again, there was like the whole, the detectives who were involved in it, Most they're, they're mostly gone now, right? Yeah. Uh, but there was a whole giant police procedural uh, stuff that, that went through parts three and five in the original draft that is really mm -hmm. mostly gone now. It's like, it was really the was most interesting thing about the, writing it for me was how much stuff wound up being like, I can't tell you because you'll never see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> for a big book like this, did you do you work from an outline? Like, how do you keep everything? Yeah, this one was outlined. Keep so yourself I do, going crazy. 
I do a super basic outline. I can't outline too hard or I won't stay interested. So I usually do an outline in terms of Roman numerals and subheaders. And then the subheaders have like a single imperative direction. Like mm -hmm. the person moves into a house to write about a crime that happened there. Okay. Period, right? Yeah. What the crime is and so forth, then I fill that in as I go, right? Mm -hmm. But with this one, it had to be a little more specific uh, in a lot of parts. But, but I have to do a sort of a ballet thing where it's like, I have an outline that's written. It's always open. It's like, it's something I can go and revise at any time. I'm not marrying mm -hmm. the original outline, right? Uh, but when I do revise it, then I take, then I have to receive it. So okay, this is what you're supposed to do today, right? Yeah. Write that today. If you don't like it, go revise the outline and tell yourself to do something else. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but, but, but it's, a, it, it's an interesting and fun balance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we have a question from B on the topic of buildings. What is the appeal of a house as a storytelling device to you? Well, I mean, I think uh, this is really, <laughs> this is very undergraduate stuff. But uh, I mean, a house is a metaphor for the human body, right? Like uh, that, that we build houses and we live inside them and they're very much like they're part of us. It's like any dwelling we're in, apartment or house or, or, or single room occupancy room, you know, they're, they're just the external housing of our bodies, mm -hmm. right? So, and I think uh, of writing as, as being a lot about bodies, about what we do with our bodies in space and how we navigate yeah. you know, the, the tension between our bodies and our spirits or minds or whatever. Um, so, uh, so, but yeah, I mean, it's like, I, I think some of this goes into, for me, the fact that, uh, and I say this in part seven, when I was a child, uh, we moved around a lot. My my parents got divorced. And so like I lived in several different places in the course of a few years. Yeah. But the first house you remember as a child is so like it's inviolate. You can't imagine yeah. it somebody else's house. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like, cool, but like like if you I remember specifically going to somebody else's house and they have like a plastic covering on the couch. And like, you what? <laughs> couches are for sitting on you know and like and all this all the things people do differently in their own houses yeah and then you learn that you're well if when you're five suddenly you don't live in that house anymore now you live with a new dad who mm -hmm. does things differently right uh it really it, it 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 opens up your thinking about houses you know and you realize that like you know that you're going to set your own parameters as a new one really quickly. You know, you 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 want the house to still be the thing that nurtures you because it is your external body, yeah. um, and so so that's what I think is 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 going on there. I, mean, I do this a lot of Wolf and White Band too. The guy navigating the the hallway and the, and the yeah. rooms in it. You know, it's like I think I think there's something in that that's very basic to me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, we have a question from Christopher. He says, "Hi, John. First and foremost, foremost, he wants to thank you for all that you do and that's your funny. writing." Yeah, and your writing has shaped the person he's become. His question, your novels frequently cover the nuances of a father-son relationship. How easy or difficult is it for you to approach that topic and what inspires you to write about it? Um, I mean, I think I think it's complicated uh, again because you know I had a father and a stepfather. Mm -hmm. um, my father didn't want to become uh, uh, a father, you know, divorced father. That was not yeah. his goal. The, 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 the dissolution of marriage was on, on my mom's part. And so, uh, so my father spent a lot of time trying to be a dad in that, in that very difficult to navigate situation. And he mm -hmm. was unable to really succeed because it's, it's almost impossible to do is like, yeah. a dad needs to be present. I'm on tour a lot, but, uh, but when I'm home, I'm home, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and if you're if you're not around for months at a time, you're going to miss vital stuff, you know. And so, so I think a lot about that, you know. About and I thought the thing is, as I've grown, you know, if you are the child of divorce, you come to think a lot about about. I mean, not everybody, I, but but for me, is like you know, I came to to view my father's engagement with this in complex ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I think parenthood is so. It's so fluid because a hundred years ago, yeah, we thought about this completely differently, right? And in other countries and cultures, there's mm -hmm. many, many ways of thinking about parenthood. We as Americans tend to think that we've well, we've landed on the one that must be right, you know, and yes. we describe, especially if we're progressive, we go, well, look, we've got this doped out. But in point of fact, 
there's a million ways to do anything, right? And most of them have some advantages and most of them have some disadvantages. In a mm -hmm. lot of places, uh, children are raised much more communally. Like the notion of, of, of the mom and dad being sort of this ultimate authority would be absurd. Yeah. You know? And, and uh, well, but if you're an American, it's almost impossible to get your head around that. It's like, yeah. especially if you're post-romantic, you know, like the, when Wordsworth and Blake mm -hmm. basically invented the child, you know, and like, yeah. uh, you know, you, uh, you, we buy that a lot. And I think about that a lot because I am not above any of that. My father, who I, you know, who I was, who was only my active, you know, daily dad until I was five, immensely important presence in my life, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think about that. I mean, I think some of that goes into it. It's like, you know, I'm always wondering what am I like if I'd been with my dad every day okay. through adolescence. Though I, I think the answer is not who I became, and I'm pretty happy with who I became. Mm -hmm. yeah. which is a complex question. Uh, okay. But yeah, but in, in, in Derek and his dad, there's a lot of wish fulfillment in there. I mean, I've written what I think is a pretty healthy family. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and I, I like, I, I like, I like that family. I like to see okay. being healthy. You know. Yeah. Uh, this is from Alexa, and it goes back to what we were talking about with structure. How do you think about structure as an element that affects the story differently than the words themselves? And in a way, words can. That's a great question. Uh, I mean, I think I think structure is hugely important. I think I have less control over what effect it has. You know, what I mean, it's like I have control, absolute control over the structure, but what it does for the story, I don't know that I understand it well enough to to say, well, I'm going to structure it like this, and then you will feel like this. Yeah. Whereas with my prose. Like I, I have a, a fairly high degree of control. Mm -hmm. like I can't promise I'm going to make you cry, but I have a good idea <laughs> yeah. of how I'm going to reach you. Like I think I can probably know when I'm in the pocket, and if you're mm -hmm. locked in, when I'm going to get to you. Like I think yeah. I know that, you know. But as far as structure goes, I have a, a curiosity about it that is kind of a. a uh, the curiosity of, of the acolyte, you know, where I'm like looking at a thing that's bigger than me and I'm not fully able to understand it, but I'm committed to it, right? I say, okay, well, I, I built this structure, so I'm going to make this, but we all learn about it together in the course of the book, which is part of what I do. Like yeah. in my writing, I'm learning as I go, right? And that's part of the thrill of mm -hmm. the book is like, I don't, I don't know exactly when my outlines are loose. So I don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. I'm not plotting it like Charles Dickens knowing exactly yeah. how to pan it out. So um, how it's going to pan out, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, so, but I think structure informs it in like, the answer is in nebulous ways that I understand as dimly as the reader does. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, I think the one thing is here, like this is a big mirror structure, right? And I'm hoping that when people read, they're going to see that each part reflects the other part and, and start to ask questions about what, what it means to look at a reflection. Because okay. reflection never tells you, what does it show you? It shows you the inverse of the thing you're looking at. Yeah. Right? Uh, well, that's interesting. You know, uh, If we're looking in the mirror, if we're looking at a selfie, if we're not flipping it, you mm -hmm. are not seeing what other people are seeing. You're seeing the opposite, right? Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Huh. And uh, for when you're writing, your goal is to write. What so that's you've learned. perspective stuff, and I try not to think much about my own growth mm -hmm. arcs and stuff, like because I sort of feel like once you do that, you crawl up inside self-regard. Yeah. I, I think it's like what's funny about being on a promotional thing. Mm -hmm. I try to think as little about myself as I can. Yeah. You know? so I like to be thinking about other people, what's going on. Mm -hmm. I'm already in myself, so I don't need to be thinking too hard about myself. But I do think, I mean, um, in writing the big book, for one thing, it's it's learning that you can do it, that you can follow a thread, mm -hmm. and 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 that my instincts are worth trusting, you know, okay. like because I didn't know exactly where it was gonna go. I didn't have a plan for the ending where I wrote this, mm -hmm. you know. But somewhere around the middle, start to ask questions, right? And start to realize that, well, here's some possible answers. And you learn to really trust, you know, like trust yourself to sit with something for a while and not have an answer today. Mm -hmm. you know? And that that's a grown-up thing, right? When we're younger, we can't stand to hear, 
you know, that there's no answer right now, but but hang out a while and we'll figure yeah. it out. It's like that's a very that's a very hard thing to hear. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in writing this book, I, I became very comfortable sitting with something for six months or a year, not knowing where it was going to go, but yeah. doing a little bit, you know, just hanging out. Uh, and then learning how much stuff there is in that moment. And that's a musical question too. Okay. If, if you're playing music, you know, when you're younger playing music, you want to get to that payoff really quick. But then you <laughs> listen to some kinds of music, it's great musicians. You know, I, I think of like, uh, uh, specifically of like uh, uh, the reggae of the seventies, right? Guys who aren't looking for the payoff, yeah. guys who are yeah. just looking for a pocket to sit in and mm -hmm. play the exact same notes for eight bars, 12 bars, 16 bars, 32 bars, knowing that something's gonna happen if we yeah. hang out in there long enough, something's gonna be cool, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, and and that is stuff that, and that's true in a lot of jazz, yeah. it's true in a lot of a lot of mellower music of the 70s, you know? And, uh, and, and that's stuff that I've learned right in this, is like just to hang out for a while, just mm -hmm. see what happens, you know? Okay, and as a writer, you have to keep coming to it on a regular daily basis for that. Just yeah, when you and it, like yeah. I said earlier, and you can throw away, right? You yeah. can you can you you can say, well, okay, but, okay, well that was interesting. Let me hit that again. You know, mm -hmm. let me just, let me come back to that now. Let me start over. And okay. for me, it's important to drag that stuff to the trash after I've looked at it. I don't want uh -huh. to revising it. I want to go, okay, well that was cool. Mm -hmm. and it's over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it's very liberating for me to like select, you know. 20,000 words of text to hit the delete button. It's mm -hmm. like, and I have a backup, but, okay. <laughs> but like, I try not to be accessed yeah, right. the backup. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, and, and and that stuff is really liberating. Go, that wasn't it, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and and that's that's fun stuff in the big book. It's like, it's yeah. you, you did a study, you know, artists, visual artists do something where they, they paint the same thing 11 times, mm -hmm. that's good paints, you know? Yeah. Uh, and and that was, that was some, some fun stuff in this. Okay. Uh, we got time for one more question. Uh, can you tell us about your literary heroes? Are there any writers who you love that are always with you when you write? Are there writers whose presence you feel in this book in particular? So I never, a lot. Know, I never know in the book I'm working on. I mean, my, uh, my prose hero is in the news a lot lately. It's Joan Didion, right? Mm -hmm. Her sentences are amazing. Um, uh, and Gosh, who else? Um, uh, Will Cather for clarity of expression for storyline, mm -hmm. you know. Um, uh, Jamaica Kincaid, uh, who doesn't have a gigantic back catalog, but but the Fury, if you've ever read her stuff, mm -hmm. when she when she gets mad, <laughs> when she's yeah. when she's engaged with something that she really wants to convey to you, the outrage of something, she settles into this really remarkably. Uh, plain spoken, but but measured tone that when I read a small place in college, it left a huge impression on me because it's a very short book, you know, but every sentence packs a giant punch. And, and th that's the other thing is like, I'm thinking of Latin writers, uh, not Latin American, but, but Roman okay. writers, because in Latin, the way mm -hmm. the sentence structure works, everything's very compact, right? It's like you're trying to get the most said in the fewest number of words in Latin for the most mm -hmm. part, and you can do mm -hmm. that. Like Latin can really compress a sentence. And I'm always wanting to do that. Well, at the same time, there's a musicality to what I do that I want it to flow, right? Whereas Latin often is so compressed. It's mm -hmm. like the, the, the translator, you have to triple the length of a line. Yeah. And I like my stuff to have a musical flow. And in that sense, I mean, who, Didion's big for me. Um, I mean, it's hard for me to say because like 90% of what I read is literature and translation, right? Okay. Uh, and so, so as stylists, like I'm reading uh, the people who do the translating for the most part. Like, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but Didion was huge for me. Mm -hmm. I read a lot of Faulkner when I was younger, but I haven't read him since I was like 19. So it's hard mm -hmm. to say what effect he had on me. Um, uh, I, I also say you never hear her name anymore. But there was a poet uh, who went by I A I, right? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and. Her stuff had, it hit a really amazing balance between the conversational and the didactic, right? Mm -hmm. She's making a point, you know, but she's also drawing you into a story. And, mm -hmm. I, and I really uh, was always, she had a book of hunger uh, when I was in college that, uh, that, that left a big impression on me, how she would manage to 
to be confronting hard subjects in a way that would sort of draw you in before, mm -hmm. before opening up the little vial of poison. You know? Okay, great. This was wonderful, John. Oh, I had a time. I yeah, yeah, I same here. I know it's my job to talk at these things, but uh, I don't know that I talk too much. No, <laughs> no, it was what, just the right amount. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, we're going to close out by Tika. Thank you so much, John and Boyce, for such a fun and insightful event. Um, and thank you to the audience for also attending. Thank you so much. If you'd like to purchase copies of Devil House, we have them signed and you could uh, purchase them on the chat um, on the left, right hand side. And so then have a good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night, good night, good night everyone. Publication day, really special day for me. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you.